right, good morning. Welcome to Bible Study Live. It is March 14th, 2021. That is 314 for those of you nerds who like to refer to this as Pi Day. It is, in fact, 3.14. So, welcome, as I said before, to Bible Study Live. We are going to be opening up the Word of God. Hopefully, you guys are going to be able to enjoy the topics that we discuss. If you have been tuning in regularly, you know that we have been talking about Christian behavior, what Christians are supposed to be doing and what other Christians are supposed to be expecting. So uh, I'm admitting people and I know others are coming and they're joining and they're saying good morning. So again, welcome, welcome. Last week, we talked about the idea of getting the plank out of your eye before you can get the speck out of someone else's eye. Now, what are some things that were really important about that? First, we don't wanna be a hypocrite. So we must remove the plank out of our eye, but we're also commanded to love one another. And part of loving one another is helping them out, helping them move forward in their relationship with Christ. So get the plank out of your eye and help your brother or sister with the plank, I'm sorry, with the speck in their eye. The goal is for no one to have anything in their eye to continue that metaphor. So hopefully that is making sense. Hopefully you guys are all on board with that. We're going to continue our discussion this morning of what to expect of other Christians, what we're supposed to be doing when we wear the name of Christ, how we're supposed to interact with one another. We already discussed this idea that Jesus says by this, by the fact that you love one another, <clears throat> excuse me, all men will know that you're my disciples. So we know we are commanded to love. And as you've already heard me, I've used some terminology. I've said brothers and I've said sisters. This morning, we're gonna talk about why we use some of these terminologies. But before I continue, I want to check in with everyone who is on the Zoom call so far and see if all of this is making sense. See if there's any things that's uh, left over from last week that you want to address right away. And I'm also going to be checking on Facebook as well. Anybody have any thoughts that need or you want to share so far? Anthony, I mean, it's fine if it doesn't come up, but I think one of the last things that was mentioned last week was how do we distinguish um, the command to love one another from the fact that we don't like a person? Ah, okay, yes, I do recall that from last week. So thank you for bringing that up again, yeah. Deb. So we're gonna talk a little bit about love versus like. I also know that we have Miss Kasma's question still hanging of, uh, are we all really children of God? Is everyone a child of God? So those are things that need to be discussed for sure. Anything else? I'm glad we're continuing this. I think, um really need to talk about this and uh, make it practical. And I like the questions from Deb and Ms. Kasma. Claire, can you say that a little louder, please? Uh, so I'm glad we're continuing with this. Um, I think it's very, very important. Oh, hi. <laughs> Teacher voice. Um, I think it's very, very important to discuss these matters. Um, I think sometimes we don't talk about that because the truth hurts. And I'm, um, I'm looking forward to discussing also Deb's and Kasma's question. All right, sounds good. Anybody else? Okay, I want to open by directing your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Actually, do I want 1 Timothy? Or do I want 1 Peter? I think I want 1 Timothy chapter 5. I looked at a couple verses that were saying some similar things. But I think I want to draw your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses, uh, I think, just 1 and 2 for right now. So I'll give you a moment to get there. Hopefully, you have a Bible. Hopefully, you are following along. And keep in mind, you got lots of options. You have a regular printed Bible. You have, um, you got apps on your smartphone. You have the, the computer in front of you, most likely. 
So you got options to get the word of God, but do open up your Bible. This is Bible study live. The Bible study is the most important part. The live is, is just kind of, you know, tossed in, but the Bible study, that's the important part. So first Timothy chapter five, of course, Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So why do we use the term brother and sister? Well, because it's biblical. This is how we're supposed to treat one another. And the idea that we belong to a family, God is the head. Jesus is your perfect big brother. He is the the author and the perfecter of your faith. He is your savior. And everyone that you encounter is uh, a part of the body, is family. So we call one another brother and sister. We don't use mother and father quite as much, but uh, I think that uh, sometimes you will see that. And I think that's appropriate at times as well. Any thoughts on this verse before we continue? All good from here. Okay. All right. So if that's all making sense, we have a couple different things that we said we're going to get into. And bear with me as I check Facebook as well to see um, any questions. Just a bunch of good mornings. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate everyone being here. Um, it's always a, a success when we can navigate this daylight saving stuff. Everyone remembers to set their clocks forward and, and we move just as though nothing happened, but it's a pretty impressive feat that everybody generally gets this right. So thank you for um, joining us, even though you missed an hour of sleep last night. So if I recall correctly, and, and I wanna check my notes because I know my daughter wrote this down Baby girl, do you remember where you put the piece of paper? I think you gave it to me a while ago, didn't you? All right, do we all believe that we're children of God? Okay. So Ms. Kasma brought up this point and Ms. Kasma, I think you are here on the line with us and my daughter has brought this to memory. And I believe your question was, are we all children of God or do we believe we're all children of God? Is that correct? That is correct. It's um, it's just a question that I had by the way that we act sometimes or the things that we say. Okay, is this more of an issue of, do we believe that we're all created equal in Christ or, or help me understand a little bit better, please, ma'am. Okay. Um, when the way that we treat others, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, or we put all these labels on people, are we aware that God created us all? And when you say equally, I don't know if that is uh, the term I'm thinking of, but the thought is to remember that well, let's explore if we believe that God created us all as, as his children. That's basically what I would say. Hmm. Okay. Any initial thoughts that any of you guys may be having upon hearing that? Any verses start coming to mind? Yes, baby girl, you got to come up here and talk to me. I cannot hear you from back there. I believe it is, it's in Genesis where, um, I'm not positive which verse it is sadly, but I do know that it was in Genesis and um, man and woman, he created them made in the image of God 
like the verse before I think he made the animals or something or maybe before he made the I'm not sure I have to look it up and then I'll let you know but um it's in Genesis the one where he was talking about um male and female he created them that one gotcha okay so baby girl you want to take us all the way back to Genesis which is uh I guess all puns intended the the best place to start we know that in the book of Genesis, and I'm flipping over in my physical Bible, where the Bible says that, where is it? Um, chapter 1, verse 27. All right, chapter 1, verse 27, my daughter's telling us, it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Now, you may be thinking, wait a second, then only males are created in the image of God. No, keep reading male and female, he created them. So God created humankind in his image. Now, uh, we touched on this, this is a little bit, um, this, is, this is getting to the weeds quite a bit, but we know also that after Adam and Eve sinned by taking of the fruit that God said, don't eat the fruit, that Eve got her name, by the way, it doesn't seem as though she had a name, but kind of why would you, need a name when you're the only other person who are you talking to obviously you um but she got her name eve and eve means mother of the living mother of all humans i'm trying to find it now i'm getting rusty while flipping through the bible like i'm supposed to ah here we go genesis chapter 3 verse 20 adam named his wife eve because the reason he named her eve is because she would become the mother of all the living. Okay, so that is the way it was phrased. So you and I are all descendants of Adam and Eve. We all trace back to one ancestor. Now, even scientists get this right. I want you to think about the irony in the way I phrase that. Even scientists manage to get this right. And I say it that way because science does not always get it right. Amen. But in this case, acknowledge there is a mitochondrial Eve, as in one female, one person that we all descend from. Well, the Bible told you that over 2,000 years ago. So you and I as Christians, as people who know the Bible to be true, we already knew that. But now science has agreed with it. And I think they've been on board with that for quite some time. So Eve, they refer to her as mitochondrial Eve. We all come from one common ancestor. Now, is this what Miss Cass was talking about? Probably not. So let's go even further. I think I want to hit you with a, a verse from a book that you probably don't read very often. And I think I want to come at you next from the book of Malachi. Malachi. Let me see if this is the verse I'm looking for. Anytime you want the book of Malachi, basically go to Matthew and then back yourself up a little bit. At least that's what I do. And we often read from the book of Malachi when we talk about giving for the contribution, you know, will a man rob God? But Malachi chapter two, and I think I want to pick it up in verse. Uh, I think I want to pick it up in verse 10. So Malachi chapter two, verse 10 says, have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? And then he goes on to say, then why do we profane the covenant uh, of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Malachi is asking the question, don't we all have one father? And I have a footnote. The footnote says father. All right, so we've all been created by the same heavenly father. So why is that significant? You guys tell me, I've been doing a bunch of talking. Why is it significant that we all were created by God and we all come from a common ancestor? Why does that matter? Um, I think it, it kind of matters where it kind of puts everybody on an equal ground we all came from like god created us all the, the father created us all and you know 
we all have partaken in the sin. We are all on an evil playing ground, if you will. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right, Jason. I like the way you have phrased that and you're drawing our attention to, of course, where we need to probably go next. Any other thoughts before we move forward? Love one another as you love yourself. Treat people like you want to be treated. I think God already had the thought of us being one people. We're all in it together and we're supposed to, to act like it. That's so true. We are supposed to act like it. Any other thoughts? All right, so uh, I got several places I want us to go. First, I want you to please look at Romans chapter three, verse 23. This talks about what Jason already brought up, where the Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means, as Jason already pointed out, we're all in the same sin boat. You are not better. I am not better. We have all sinned. And here's another thing. And I'm going to send this out. I don't know who needs to hear that this morning. But you are also not worse than anyone else. You need to know that. Some people think that they, they, they're, they are irredeemable. No, you are not. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away all sins. And you and I need to accept and embrace that to obey what God has called us to do. Know, but I you and I are on the same. So no. What's that? Not most of them, no. I think I've had an actual right. copies. Hang on a sec, Deb. I want to I want to finish making this point. You and I are on the same plane, the same level playing field of being imperfect, of having failed. So you are no better, but you are also no worse. And again, I emphasize this because some of you guys think, man, I've just done too much. You know, I can't come back to God. No, you can come back. God wants you back. He loves you and he wants you. Whoever's hearing this, he wants you to come back to him. So we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that, but we don't always act like we know that. And I don't even think this is the crux of what Ms. Kasma is saying, but I think we're building and I think we're getting there. Is there something you want to share, my love? All right, Aurelio's got something. Let me read what Aurelio's saying to us on Facebook. Uh, Aurelio's talking about Jonah chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. God talks to Jonah about how their, how their people were created and cared for by God. Jonah is not caring for them like God does. Uh, Aurelio, that's a great point. Jonah did not want those people to be saved. He wanted those people to be destroyed. And Jonah wouldn't go to Nineveh willingly because he was afraid that if he preached to them, they would repent and not be destroyed, which is awful, but it still happens today. But God says, no, I care about those people. I want them saved. And I'm going to send you to go preach to them, Jonah. Jonah says, I don't want to go. And if you know anything about Jonah, you should learn telling God no don't work. Jonah's like, no, I'm going the opposite direction. God says, mm -mm. I'm going to provide a storm. If, you, if you're familiar with the King James, I believe God provided a storm that was terrifying. It was going to sink the ship. Jonah needed that storm. And then when they threw Jonah over, God provided a fish. Jonah needed that fish. And the fish spewed him up on dry land. After three days, Jonah went and preached, and he was still mad. He still didn't want it. But that's a, a great example that sometimes God's people, and God chose Jonah to carry out this mission, even though Jonah was unwilling. God says, you're going to do it anyway, because these people hearing this message is more important to me than your attitude and your unwillingness to cooperate. So you're going. So God cares. God sends people uh, sometimes unwilling. And by the way, when you go unwilling, it ain't going to be fun for you. 
I want you to think about it. It wasn't like this was fun for Jonah. Jonah was miserable and for good reason, but he chose to do it the hard way. So don't be like that. Uh, I'm still building though. I'm getting to the point of, are we all children of God? We are supposed to be. And I want to draw your attention next to this verse. Um, if you're going to talk to you, you got to come up here, baby girl. Well, do you we believe we're all children? Okay. Go ahead, Jason. We're, we're all birth children of God per se, but we're not all spiritual children because they're God, you know, looked at some people was like, yeah, such and such, such and such, but you are of your father, the devil. Jason, why you keep saying what I'm saying before I can say it? It's it's like so, I am ESPN or something. Yeah, or like the Bible <laughs> that you've been reading. I think is uh is is probably what we're doing here. So John chapter eight verse forty four. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Now this is super ironic if you are familiar at all with Jewish tradition, if you're familiar at all with Jewish lineage, because Jesus is issuing an absolutely scathing. I mean, he is torching these Pharisees in John chapter eight. I want to give you a little bit of context as Hopefully most of you know this, but John chapter eight, Jesus is talking to a group of the elite Jewish rulers and leaders. These are people who set themselves up higher than everyone else. They said, we're the smart ones. We're the most spiritual. You guys need to do what we say and do it how we say. You need to try and live like us. And these are the people that Jesus had the most trouble with. These were the most religious people, but the people who were furthest from God. Yeah, they were religious. So in John chapter 8, Jesus goes on a discourse with them, and he draws a conclusion that they were absolutely not wanting to hear, not wanting to believe. Let me see where I want to pick this up. All right, so I think I want verse 31, then I'll probably jump down to maybe verse 39. So Jesus says, to the Jews who had believed him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Now, talk about this a little bit. I don't want to belabor it too much, but you need to know that the Bible contains the true words of God. But watch this. It's a little bit of a curveball. The Bible also has lies. Now, wait a minute. What am I saying? What we just read is not true. It's what they said, but it's a lie because they say we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. That is 100% false. The truth is they've been slaves of everybody. Have you read the book of Exodus? They were slaves in Egypt. The descendants of Abraham were slaves in Egypt. Babylon, Persia, Syria, and let's not forget that they're slaves of Rome while they're standing there saying this. So you need to see how off base they are already. They say we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? They are completely and totally enslaved and have been enslaved because of disobedience throughout their entire history. So they start off wrong. And Jesus goes on and he says, everyone who, who sins is a slave to sin. That's very relevant for us right now. Verse 39, they said <laughs> Abraham is our father. You guys all right? They say Abraham is our father. 
And Jesus says, if Abraham, I'm sorry, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. And here it comes. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. I want you to understand some of the stuff that's going on. They're trying to tell Jesus we are righteous. We don't need what you're telling us. We already have this together because we are Abraham's descendants. We are the people of God by birth. And Jesus says, no, you're not. In fact, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and now am here. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you were unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. So let's get back to kind of what Miss Casma was saying. You either belong to God or you don't. You either recognize that other people belong to God or they don't. And you belong to God if you obey what he commands. So we have one creator and that's God. Whether you accept him or not, you got one creator. He is also Lord. Keep in mind that even if you don't believe in him now, the Bible says every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. It's going to happen. So he is your Lord. He is your God. He is your creator, even if you don't want him to be. Just like these people had an emperor that was ruling over them, whether they wanted him or not. Doesn't matter. He is the emperor, and you're either going to obey him or you're going to be destroyed. You don't get a choice in this part because God is who he is. Your choosing to obey him doesn't change the fact that he is sovereign and he sets the rules. Now, here's what we need to realize. If you think you have the ability to pick and choose who belongs to God, you are part of the problem. If you think God loves you more than those people over there, if you think that you are better than that person over there, then you are part of the problem. You're doing exactly what the people who opposed Jesus did. Remember how offended they were that he ate with sinners and tax collectors. Ew. These people were gross. They were shunned. They were looked down on, and rightfully so, they thought. So when Jesus came along, he actually went to their house and he ate? Are you out of your mind? No. In fact, he was the only one who was in his right mind. So... If there is a thinking, if there is a thought, a belief, a perception that these people over here are somehow less than, then you had better watch out because you stand in the same shoes that the Pharisees were standing in. You stand in the same shoes that Jonah was standing in. And those are very dangerous places to be. And when I say you stand in those shoes, I mean, I want you to think about the last person who stood here was destroyed. The last person who stood here opposed Jesus. You don't want to be anywhere near that type of position. So if you say, well, you know what, these other people got, I mean, just, just forget about them. Just let them go. If you say it out loud, if you behave that way, if that's in your heart, you need to have that removed because that is not of God. So you can either accept the fact that God wants everyone or not. But if someone is going to be rejected and you think I'm going to choose who's going to be rejected, then you're choosing for yourself to be rejected, which is the, the opposite of what they thought was going to happen. Now watch this. 
Um, this is what Jesus says. Mark, I think I want Matthew chapter 21, verse 31. Um, yeah, Matthew 21, 31. Check this out. This is what Jesus says to them. Let me flip over here real quick. Because Jesus dealt with the Pharisees a lot. And some of his harshest criticism was towards the Pharisee. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. That would have blown their minds and probably drove them up the wall. How dare you say these sinners are entering into the kingdom of heaven at all, let alone ahead of us? What? That's impossible. Yeah. They're getting in, and you're not. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on. And Ms. Kazma, I believe some of your question has to do with do we truly believe that those who belong to God belong to God? Do we truly believe that we are treating one another as equals? And sometimes no. Sometimes there's, you know, those people over there we don't want to associate with. But it's all about who God has decided belongs to his family. He decides, not you, not me. In fact, he told us we don't get to make that choice. Only thing we can do is be obedient and spread the gospel. God will provide the increase. So if we are treating other members of the body, if we're treating other people on this planet as though somehow they are not loved by God, we stand in a very dangerous position. We need to repent and just stop doing that. Yes, I look at... Um... Just throwing a couple more. John 1, 12. It's a, it's a matter of making a decision of receiving the sonship. Uh, I think Romans 8, 16 talks about the sonship as well. So it's a matter of the obedience and putting yourself into God's hand that I think sometimes people get confused with when it talks about, uh, like Romans 8, 16 says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And it, that is a kind of, uh, like I said, the sonship, it, it's like accepting God and becoming his disciple are two different things. You get where I'm going? You know, you, you can believe in God, you can believe in Christ, but if you are not obeying him, that's a difference. If you are not living according to his ways, then just believing is not enough. He even says that. You call me Lord, Lord. Uh, so that's kind of where it was coming that people kind of decide that they are but they don't look at the, the par parameters that it would take to become, to, to accept that sonship. And they make that decision for others. Thank you for elaborating on that. So I got a couple verses. And by the way, if you guys got thoughts, jump in. I'm checking Facebook, but uh, I can go all morning long. Um, kind of without as much input as I should have. So I don't want to do that. I do want to draw your attention to Ephesians chapter two, and then we're going to jump over to some verses in Ephesians chapter four. So let's go to Ephesians chapter two and pick it up in verse 11. I'm going to skip around just a little bit, but it says in Ephesians chapter two, verse 11, 
Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So whatever you were, now you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ. Now we're all one. Now we're all united as the body of Christ. And so now I wanna jump over to Ephesians chapter four. I think I wanna pick it up in verse four. So Ephesians four, verse four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You should be hearing the word one and all again and again, because that is what this verse is saying. There is only one church and it has nothing to do with the building or what you put on the wall. You either belong to the one church, the one body of Christ, or you don't. Because there is one God, one Father, one Spirit. And that is what all are being called. There's no black church or white church or Asian church or rich church or poor church. And if you have set up your physical building, if you have set up your circle of friends and people with whom you associate with that way, then you're doing it wrong. Not well, you could be, you're doing it wrong. It's not how God said it's supposed to be. And if you feel like, no, 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 we got, we kind of got our own thing. Well, then you're not in God's. I want you to think about it. If your assembly, if your brotherhood, if your fellowship, your church, and I hesitate to say the word church because oftentimes we think of just the building, but if your congregation is separate, if it is elite, if it is somehow exclusionary, then it is not God's. You are not in God's will. You are outside of God's will. Abandon that and join what God has created. So this idea, do we believe that we're all children of God? Man, you better. If you don't, you're wrong. Does that offend you? If it does, that means you're wrong and you need to repent. You need to change. Now, it may be uncomfortable. Well, yeah, I mean, God didn't tell you to be comfortable. He will provide comfort, but God's commands have always taken us out of our comfort zone. Your comfort zone is not where God is using you. Your comfort zone is where the devil wants to keep you. So get outside of that, do what God has commanded and embrace who he is and what he said. You wanna share with us, baby girl? I do. So the first thing I, I, I want this to say is if it was comfortable to do what God said, then God wouldn't necessarily say it because we would have already done it anyway. It would have been like, it would have just been a wetless point to just say, okay, um, this, this isn't the best example, but go eat pizza. That's I'm comfortable with eating pizza. Right. So you don't have to tell me twice to go do it. And then the second thing, is if we were the ones who were going to decide um, who would go 
like be in heaven, it would technically be a pretty empty spot because we all have our own little group and no, and, and um, no, no, your sin is just okay, but that person, mm -mm, you're not going. So that's why we're not God because if we were God, I don't think there would be a world in this point because we, we wouldn't be doing the things that God wants us to. So I'm pretty sure that's why we're not God. Yeah, there's lots of reasons why we're not God. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I think ironically, we would manage to exclude ourselves as well. Like if you had to write down some rules and some laws about those who are good and those who are not, if you're honest, you realize you break those laws. You wouldn't even live up to your own standards. You would fail. So it's important that we obey God, we embrace what he has commanded us, and we do it as he commanded us to do it. Any other thoughts? I love you, baby. I love you, baby girl. Any other thoughts about this? Okay, since I'm not hearing any other thoughts, I'm gonna check Facebook. I'm not seeing um, anything that I need to address on Facebook. So let's talk about what Deb has brought up, a very important topic regarding loving someone versus liking them. And this is a great topic because we do have issues among brothers and sisters that Sometimes it's hard to get along. So we're commanded to love, but not to like. Now I'm gonna ask this question, and this is not directed to you, Deb. So if you are, if you are I think that you're where you can hear me. Thank, thank you, Anthony, so I appreciate that. Yeah, so this is not a question that I expect you to answer. And, and here's the question. I want, I want us to think about this for a moment. What is the difference between loving someone and liking someone? Don't answer yet. I want you to think about it. When it comes to being one in Christ, if you love someone but you don't like them, I want you to think about it. Don't answer just yet. What does that look like? I want you to think. My daughter's really wanting the answer. Think, think, think some more. And I want to have you think about that. And I want to share a quick example. I think several years ago, I was having a conversation with Anastasia, the cute little voice that you guys hear, my daughter here with us. You are little, stop incorrecting me. She's 11, she thinks she's old and not little, she's little. And she asked me one day, she said, daddy, do you like me? I said, baby girl, I love you. You know, cause clearly love is, is greater than like. And she kind of paused for a little bit. I think she may have been second, third grade. And I'd already answered the question. And she paused and she said, but do you like me? And I tried to go back with, yeah, I love you. But that didn't answer her question. And it started to kind of dawn on me that wait a minute, there, there's something else going on here. And I guess a moment went by and it, and it, it sort of clicked like, wait a minute, you're, you're, not, you're not understanding what she's asking. And so I said, yeah, baby, I like you. And that's, that, that made her happy. And she kind of smiled and we played and, and we went on. What was my takeaway from that? My takeaway was it's important for me to show love. And as a father, part of the way that I show love is I provide, you know, I'm here, I, I, I discipline 
you know, these are things that a father does to show love. But my daughter's asking a question that I think translated is, do you want to actually be around me? Do you enjoy my company? Amen. Do you want to spend time? Do you want to play together? Because I can say I love her when I go off to work and I provide and I, you know, I do all these manly things that I'm supposed to do. You know, I protect, you know, if there's some danger, you know, I'll punch it in the face. But do I want to play with the tea set? Do, do I want to, to watch the show that is important to her? Do I want to hear about that book she just read? Because that's important. So I have an understanding now of what it means to love and to like my kid. And now please answer if you feel so inclined, what does it mean to love versus like your brother and sister in Christ? What does that look like from your perspective? Whoever feels like answering. Do you want to answer? All right, go ahead. I think the difference between loving someone and liking them. So for this example, if you love somebody, you want to make sure that they're okay. Like if you see someone crying, you want to make sure that they're not um, in pain. But if you like them, you know, you, you want to talk, socialize, you know, do what you would do with a friend. But you, if you love them, but, but don't like them, you want to, you, usually you wouldn't want to see them sad or not doing well if you love them. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that, baby girl. Any other thoughts? I, what comes to mind um, as a difference is thinking about um, boundaries and um, there's certain people that we have to distance ourselves whether emotionally or physically or whatever from um and we still love the person but we do not like uh, to spend time with them or um we do not um we do not um intentionally go out of our way to uh do something that they that's not like needed or an emergency or something like that. That's how in my head I can think about the difference between like and love. Okay. Now, for those of you who might've been confused, the fact yeah. that the, hold, hold on a second. Let me, let me, let me have a, a little smidge of fun before we get serious again. For those of you who might've been confused as you, you saw the name Hal, but you heard Claire's voice. That's because that's something happened recently. There, there, there's something that's taking place. And for those of you who may not be savvy, you may not be on Facebook, you may not realize that Hal has proposed marriage to Claire. And Claire said yes. So, so they're engaged to be married. And, and so when you see the name Hal, but you hear the voice of Claire, that is not a coincidence, all right? My man Hal is, is making moves. He, he is very <laughs> intentional, all right? He, he has a, he's got a plan in place. It's, it's what I want you to realize. So as, as I see the name Hal and I hear Claire's voice, I know that they are, spending time together. And if I'm correct, they are probably traveling to, to meet with people to worship the Lord and to serve in his, uh, his body. So uh, Winsley is, is throwing up the congratulations, uh, the little celebration thing. So congratulations to Hal and Claire for your engagement. And uh, I just want to take that time to have my own bit of fun and, and hopefully be an encouragement. I love you guys both. And I'm excited for all the things that are happening. And uh, Claire, make sure next time we see you, you're showing off that ring. And we will continue to share in your joy. Yes, I love and like them. 
<laughs> that is Thanks, absolutely guys. right. Thank you. Love you guys. Excellent. All right. So let's get back to what we're talking about. I, I believe there's at least one comment on Facebook. There's several, there's four comments on Facebook. All right, let me hit these real quick because they scroll past me relatively quick. A lot of people are saying congratulations. Uh, see, they already scrolled past me. I should have been faster. Now the congratulations are rolling in. So everybody's congratulating Claire. Congratulate how too? Y'all don't know how like that, but you good dude, you like how. Yeah, he's part of it. <laughs> yeah, he is. Thanks. <laughs> he started it all. All right, let me read what my cousin uh, Rosia says. Uh, she says, I know I'm a sinner, but I have a heavenly father who still loves me. He's real. My God lives within me, acknowledges his will and his blessing for me. Just seeing and being aware of his, uh, his glory just brings tears to my eyes uh, and a cause of joy. So I agree with that so much. Miss Fran Tate has said, loving someone means treating someone just like you treat yourself. To like someone means you care for them, but not on the same level as yourself. And, and I, I like that. I think that makes a, an important distinction. And then Deanna says that I can love someone in my family and not like them. Love can be an obligation while like can be a choice. So true. And uh, Sherelle says love is unconditional, but like is conditional. I, I agree with, with all of those. Thank you for sharing that with me, love. So there's so much truth to that. And I want us to, this is a little uncomfortable, but I want us to go back to what Jesus said. And, and here's what he talked about. He says in John chapter 13, we've already read this, I think a couple weeks ago, but Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Now, how did Jesus love us? <clears throat> Let me ask that again. <clears throat> how did Jesus love us? And as you're thinking about that, ask yourself, does Jesus like us? Because he says to love as I love you. Does God, does Jesus, does the Holy Spirit like you? Some of you may not have thought about that. And I want you to think about this. If God said to you, if Jesus said, if you read in the Bible, insert your name here, I love you, but I don't like you. I love you but I don't like you. Now, you and I both know sometimes we're not easy to love. Sometimes we're not even easy to like. But if God told you, I love you, but I don't really like you, how are you feeling now? Not good. No. Not good at all. To me, love is, uh, I agree with the honor that love is, it's a choice, but it comes with obligation. Like is acceptance. Like I can love a person, but not like the way they wear their hair or not like their attitude, but to love is a deeper thing than like, like is a superficial, like is the, like maybe the day-to-day -day of how you live your life. I might not like the choices that you're making. I might not like your politics. I might not like uh, different things like that, but I love you at the core. And Jesus's love to us was unconditional because he ignored the likes in order to love, and if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. If, so when you say like, I, I feel like it's taking into account your 
your actions, what you do, how you make me feel. Whereas love, you asked how, uh, how Jesus loved us and he loved us to death. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm struggling trying to separate these two for real. You know, that's, that's really the, the crux of it. But um, I, I just feel like it's hard to have one without the other, but at the same time, there is a difference. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm working through it. It's a challenge, isn't it? All right, so here's what I want to encourage you. And I think I kind of gave this away up front. I think it needs to be really, really difficult for someone that you have been commanded to love, I think it needs to be very difficult for that person to realize that you don't like them. Now I know there's personalities, there's people you get along with more than with others and Jesus had three people that he was closest to, get it, totally track it. But does that mean he didn't love or like the other nine apostles? I think if you were to look at his actions, if you were to say, okay, I know Jesus says, I love you. I can't tell which one of these guys he likes. I can't tell which one of these guys he doesn't like. And, and this is not to, to beat up on anyone who is having a difficult time interacting with other members of the body. Cause some people get on your nerves. I get it. I am that person that get on some of y'all nerves. I get that. He may say, you know what? I'm going to love you from afar. Isn't that a nice way of saying, I don't really like you? I'll, it's easier for me to love you over there. Okay, well, yeah. But your goal, your command is to love. And you say, well, what if I don't like them? Love as Christ loved. So you, but I don't know if he likes and I think that's kind of the issue that we're dealing with. This needs to oh, become obvious who you like versus who you don't. And in a group of people who are as different as members of the body of Christ are, there's going to be challenges. But my encouragement is don't rest comfortably in the knowledge that I love this person, but I don't like him. Um, okay, first of all, God didn't tell you to like him. He said, love him. He said, but I do, but I don't like him. It, it gets a little difficult to start making that distinction. And I want us to make sure that we are always moving in the direction of the love that God has commanded. It is impossible without his strength to do this. You and I will not come up with this on our own. Now, mother's love is amazing. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see a, a natural thing that God has built in. The love of a parent to a child is a, a wonderful thing. Husband to wife uh, and brother to brother, sister to sister. But there's a, a breakdown where our love is not perfect, but we can't stay there. So we may love, but not like, and I encourage you, and I'm going to need you to encourage me to keep moving. Say, I love them, but I don't like them. Okay, keep moving. Get to the point where you love them as Christ loved them, and you can't tell if you like them versus don't like them, which is awkward and uncomfortable. Give me some, some final thoughts as we get ready to close up. Well, this is Deb. Um, let's see if I can get back here. Ah, here we are. Um, I personally will go back to what Anthony said at the beginning for him came up, uh, that like is about willing to spend time. Love is, for me, they're very distinct. Um, they're very distinct. There are people I love that I really don't have a lot of interest in spending time with. It doesn't stop me from loving them. I don't seek them out. They don't build me up. Um, that's not fair. They don't leave me feeling light or enlightened or it's it's a struggle 
it's a struggle to spend time with them, but it doesn't, it doesn't, they're, they're family members. It doesn't diminish my love for them. Um, well, personally, I think the distinction of, so thanks Anastasia for insisting that your father answer the question when, whenever that was. Um, is that lo loving somebody, I can get with Anthony about that's the person you go at, whether it's earning money or protecting or whatever that looks like. Um, and liking is, does your face light up when they call you? Can you not wait to see them again? Can you have conversations with them that you maybe not be able to have conversations with somebody else? Um, which maybe builds the love, but it's still, it's, I think Kasma said it, it's still the, may not like the hairstyle or a particular activity or a particular um, way of thinking of things. But, but then to me, love would have you overlook those. So, but I definitely think there's a distinction between loving somebody and liking somebody. And when they're tied up in the same person, I think it's really hard when you know you love somebody, but you're really not anxious to see them or spend time with them or do things with them. So, thank you for sharing that. Sure. If you want to discuss this further, because we've kind of dovetailed it on the end of a lot of our other discussions, I think it is perfectly fair to pick this up next week. I want to leave you guys with this verse because Jesus is so amazing. He says in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Now we know that... Um, Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples, and this is the night that he is going to be betrayed and tried, if you can even call it a trial, and then crucified. But Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal, and that encourages me. God likes you. God wants to be around you, and we talked about this. He wants to actually spend forever with you which is amazing. You can say, you know what? I'm just going to save you guys from your sins. I'm going to do this stuff, but I can't deal with you. I cannot be around you people. He doesn't say that. He says, I want you to come to my house. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm building rooms. I'm adding on. I'm making a place just for you. And Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Why do you have many rooms? Because he wants many people in those rooms. Unlike some of us, you got a guest room, but you don't want to have guests. Guilty as charged. God didn't have guest rooms. He wants them full with you and me and all the other people that you probably don't like. But he loves them. He likes them, whatever. And, and this is not to, to uh, in any way, pick on anybody that's having a difficult time dealing with personalities. Because that's, that's really... Um, significant but i want you guys to realize who god is how much he loves he cares about you and others and be about that life where you go and you share that love you say you know what god is crazy about you he sent his son to die on the cross so that you could spend forever with him that's his ultimate goal not so you can you know have health and wealth and listen to a preacher on tv or even on facebook but so that you can have a relationship that lasts forever because he wants that relationship with you. So hopefully you're encouraged. I am encouraged. I don't know if you're gonna try and get this hour of sleep back or not, but you're up, make it a great day and uh, be blessed. Thank you guys for joining us.